the reading today is again from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. All right. Rahab. Um, so originally this was supposed to be just Rahab, and then for some reason it, the walls of Jericho got tacked on, so it's part of the same story, so it's going to be both. Um, all right, so um, I was really looking forward to this one. This is a great story um, on a lot of different levels, so it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of scripture reading. I'm going to let the Bible do most of the work because I'm lazy, um, but I think it'll be interesting. Um, one of the things uh, I love to do is when I'm reading scripture and um, studying it is really get into what the world was like, the background, how the people who are actually living this lived and um, filling in all the details and, and colors and um, what was it like at that time because that can affect how we received the text and how the um, people who Hebrews was originally written to would receive the text. Um, so this, this should be fun, um, I think. Maybe it'll be incredibly boring, so sorry if I'm lifting it up too much. Um, but um, first, I'm going to uh, just tell you the story. So these stories, this is a pre, um, uh, this is a pre, uh, not pre-literate necessarily, but most people didn't read, most people didn't have books. Um, you would tell stories at night, like there was no TV, obviously. Um, so you just hear the story, and these are the stories you would grow up hearing if you were a child uh, growing up in Israel. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story, just verbally, so you get the overall image in your head. And then, then we're just going to go through the Bible and read it, and I'll go in certain sections, and we'll just kind of park there and... Um, bring out some details in life, and then hopefully by the end of it, you'll, you'll see Rahab in a different light, maybe not completely different, but she'll become more of a person, because she was a really remarkable woman and had a, a great, uh, really outsized influence in all of human history, actually, um, when you consider that uh, everything. So, um, we will... Uh, Dig in. Okay, um, so the story, the story. Um, the story is uh, Israel, the people of Israel, were in not the promised land yet. They were on the other side of the Jordan River, and the Jordan River was kind of the dividing line of where their land was. They had to cross the Jordan to get to the land. Um, Moses was with them. They were in a place called Shittim. Um, and this is where Deuteronomy takes place, the book of Deuteronomy, if you've heard of it. Great book. Um, and they're waiting there, and Moses dies, Joshua takes over, and um, they have to go now and conquer the land that God has given them. So, Joshua, who was leading them, he was Moses' assistant, and now he's leading them. He sends out spies. Um, we know about two spies. He may have sent out more, but at least two spies went out they went all over the land, and especially Jericho, because Jericho was stop number one. And conquering Jericho would... Um, no, you can go back a slide still. Yeah, we're not there yet. Cool. Thank you. By the way, if you like this artwork, um, the artist only goes by the initials AI. Um, <laughs> actually, every artwork you'll see today is AI. <laughs> I couldn't find pictures that match, so I was like, oh, I'll make something. Um, so... I had a conversation with Cody early on about AI, and he was like, oh, there's no place in the church for AI. So, you know, you know. <laughs> Exception. <laughs> What's up? What? A prompt? Oh, Adobe Express. Yeah, just a prompt, yeah. I was winging it here. So that's a, that's a spies in Rahab on the, on the rooftop, uh, and then that's a, yeah, yeah, you know. I have a way with prompts. 
Um, <laughs> I take full credit. Uh, so the story, they're, so they're, um, Joshua is sending out the spies. They go into the land. Now they are not only uh, uh, searching out the land, they're also specifically looking at Jericho. Jericho was a walled city. So that means the way you attack a walled city is who knows how. Alva, how do you attack a walled city? <laughs> Siege. Yeah. So siege is the way you attack a walled city, and it can get hairy, both on the inside and outside of it. Um, so he's uh, sending out these spies to find out about the land and about what they're going to face. But this time, um, I'll get to that later. So they're going to find out all the stuff. Anyways, the spies are in Jericho, but they get found out by the people in Jericho. So um, where they're staying is um, in the house of Rahab, who is a prostitute, and she hides them. She hides them up on the roof. They had flat roofs at that time, Um, and she hides them under flax, which is like a big grain. Um, uh, Not grain, it was like a, yeah, it's like a plant. We'll get into it, believe me. Um, so they hide in that, and she tells the, the guys who are chasing them, oh, they're, they just left. It's, it's, it's nighttime now. It's getting towards nighttime. If you hurry, you can get them. So the, the men rush out, and they, they go after them, and then she tells the two spies, she says, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to let you down by the wall, but you have to go up in the hills, hide for three days, and then, and then go. But I want you guys to spare me and my father's household. And so they, they agree to that, and they tell her, just hang this scarlet cord outside your window. Her window was um, on the wall. Hang it on the wall, and we won't attack your family, and we'll save you. And uh, she, she lets them go, and the, they're true to their word, and they save Rahab, um, just as Rahab had saved them. So that's the overall story. And of course, the walls of Jericho, you guys know what happened to that. If you don't, they march around seven times, and the walls fall down and they just annihilate everything in Jericho, except for Rahab and her family. So that's a story, that's a story. And it's such a great story. It's, it, I was trying to figure out how to, how to do this sermon, and I, I just thought, you know, I'll just let the story speak for itself. Um, and I'm just gonna, like I said, just park and kind of bring out details. So we're gonna read through this. Um, I have the text printed out here, which is why you won't see me opening my Bible very much, but I'm, it's here, just copied. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Now the spies, the spies. So this is uh, this passage you'll find in uh, Joshua chapter two. Actually, I'm going to turn there just so I make sure I can give you a good reference. I think it's two. Yeah, two one, chapter two verse one. Um, and Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying. Go view the land, especially Jericho. So, um, again, the artist AI. Uh, so, Shittim, again, we, we kind of talked about that. That's where the Israelites were. They, were. they were parked there. That's where Deuteronomy takes place, where Moses gives his final sermon. Um, and uh, and it, it, it's where they're going to leave. Um, it's east of the Jordan River, so it's on the other side of where they're supposed to where they're supposed to end up being. Um, so they're going to, uh, oh, this is an interesting detail. So the name Shittim means like it's acacia trees. So you can imagine if that helps you in your mind visualize trees, um, a lot of trees. <laughs> so they're, um, they're getting ready. They're getting ready. Okay, so who were the spies? So. Do you guys, uh, if you're familiar with the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, do you remember last when we saw spies, when spies came up? There were spies. Moses sent out spies. This would be 40 years prior to this. They sent out 12 spies, one from each tribe, to see the land of Canaan. One of those spies was Joshua when he was younger, a young lad. Um, They went out and spied out the land, and they saw how good it was, but they also saw giants, and they were scared. So they gave a bad report, except for Joshua and Caleb. They gave good reports. They said, the land is good. God's going to give it to us. They didn't care how scary looking it was. 
Well, this was one of the, uh, one of the, the reasons that God um, said, finally, with this generation, none of you are going to the promised land, except for Caleb and Joshua. Um, but this time, the spies um, are going out, and the intent is, we already know the land is good. We're going to conquer it. We're just going to get some details. <sighs> um, and these spies, uh, we don't know much about them. They might have been uh, trusted leaders in Israel. Um, they were definitely trusted um, because uh, Joshua ended up being pretty important. Caleb ended up being pretty important. So they were probably sending out, I think, important people to spy out the land. All right, now Rahab. Rahab. Um, okay. Moving on in our verse, and they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Okay, so let me start with Rahab. Let me start with Rahab. I'm going to start going way past. This is, this is her reputation. Her reputation years and years and centuries and centuries later. I want you to kind of get an idea of it. First of all, in the book of Joshua, this is a verse that comes at the end. It says, But Rahab the prostitute in her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So the book of Joshua paints her in a very positive light. Um, in Matthew, we don't hear anything more about Rahab in the Old Testament. Not until we get to the New Testament. In Matthew, she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, and we will get into that a little bit. Um, but she's one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ, which is why I said earlier, like, she has this kind of, like, outsized influence in human history um, and in cosmic history. Um, obviously, she's in Hebrews, this, the passage we're in. And then, in, in, again, in the book of James, in the book of James, and I'll just read that to you. It's in James 2, chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 25. He uh, previously talks about the faith of Abraham, and then he mentions Rahab. He says, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. So James, is, James the brother of Jesus, is also praising Rahab, who is also his ancestor. So, um, uh, And then uh, in Josephus, uh, Josephus was the Jewish historian who was probably born around the time Jesus died, but he was roughly contemporaneous with that, that era of the New Testament being written. Um, he records this story in Antiquities, um, and I'll just read this little passage. Um, and when she was brought to him, Joshua owned to her that they owed her thanks for her preservation of the spies. So he said he would not appear less than she in his kindness to her, whereupon he gave her certain lands immediately and had, ha and had her in great esteem ever afterwards. Um, and that's not in the Bible, but that's Josephus. His, his view of her was glowing, like she's the greatest. <laughs> um, and in the Talmud and Midrash, these are like uh, Jewish texts that um, are kind of like common Bible commentaries, kind of. Um, it actually says that she became Joshua's wife, um, which, you know, we have the genealogy in Matthew, so probably that wasn't the case, but... Um, that's a pretty big deal if, like, they're thinking Joshua married um, Rahab. So she has this really good reputation. So now let's, let's, uh, let's, let's ask a question. So you can go to the next slide. If, if you're like me and you're reading this, what were those spies doing in a prostitute's house? Uh, um, and there's, there's a kind of interesting thing. So you can see by the headline, it says, uh, the header, it says, prostitute, innkeeper, or both. And the reason I put innkeeper up there is because there's a, there's a reason why, um, why she may have been an innkeeper. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, explain that. So again, Josephus. Josephus said, um, doesn't describe her as a prostitute at all. He just calls her an innkeeper. Um, this is a quick excerpt. He says, But at even they, went, they retired to a certain inn, this is the spies, that was near to the wall where they went to eat their supper. So they were 
staying there, and she was an innkeeper. This is Josephus' version. Um, and there, there's a couple other sources that would put it like that. Um, so why uh, would he describe it like that? Um, the, the Hebrew, you can go to the next slide, um, and the next one, yeah, yeah. So the Hebrew word for prostitute could take on, on both meanings. This is a maybe. It's not like, yeah, let me clarify that. It's not, it can definitely be both, but some scholars think it may have had both meanings because both, uh, if you were a woman who had an inn, you would also be a prostitute. Um, and the, the two job descriptions kind of overlapped. Um, some scholars think that. Um, and if you go to the next one, uh, the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, version of the Bible, um, which the New Testament authors used, um, it uses a word that only means prostitute. And if you go to the next slide, the New Testament uses words that also only mean prostitute. So I think that the answer is somewhere in between. I think probably the best way to understand it is that she was a prostitute, but also was keeping an inn. So it was maybe... Uh, both. So that's probably why they were, they were there um, as an inn, but who knows what else they were doing. I don't know. Um, the Bible doesn't say. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so, and I, I realized when I was building these slides, I was like, I say prostitute a lot in this. Um, a little awkward, but <laughs> it's a, I think it's an important point because it's part of who she was. And um, the first thing we have to do, though, when we're looking at what prostitution was like back then is, um, is that, uh, you can go to the next slide? Yeah. We have to unlearn what we, what we think we know about prostitutes. Like, we have our own cultural understanding of what that is. And um, you could think someone who's in desperate straits or being trafficked or, or, you know, we have all kinds of ideas. And we kind of have to take that and just like, this is our time in our place. Um, we think of someone who might be a complete like outcast in society. Again, this is our time and our place. To understand what it was like back then, if you go to the next slide, um, we really don't know what it was like back then. There's not a lot written. In fact, um, go to the next slide and you'll see uh, the best uh, that I know of, the best description we have is, is of Judah and Tamar. And if you're unfamiliar with that, um, that passage, uh, that, uh, uh, it's a story in Genesis 38, 15. And, and Tamar, who is also an ancestor of Jesus, interestingly, um, Tamar uh, was the, without getting too into the weeds on this, because this is an interesting story too, um, she was uh, supposed to be given one of the sons of Judah. Um, she was married to one of Judah's sons. He died. So there's this idea of like a, a kinsman redeemer or a leveret marriage where the, uh, the brother, if your brother dies and he has a wife and you're not married, you marry his widow so she can have a son. This is the way that it was kind of like the social security program, like how you had kids and she can still be part of society. Um, that son died, and so Judah's like, oh, wait for my younger son. She waited. He ended up marrying her off to some, uh, his son off to someone else, I think. Um, and uh, so she, what's she going to do? So she goes to this town where she knows Judah's going to go. She dresses uh, like a prostitute, which the description is, um, it's in uh, Genesis 38, 15, uh, it says, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. So maybe like wearing a veil or something was an indicator that you're a prostitute. Other than that, we don't know much about it. So we don't know much about what that, what, how they were thought of, what, uh, especially in Canaan, um, in Jericho. We don't know much about it. So kind of like if you can kind of keep an open mind about what her life was like, um, it wasn't necessarily as some outcast of society. Um, it may have been, but not necessarily. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Um, more back to our uh, story in Genesis. I mean, sorry, in Joshua. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. 
Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. All right, so we're going to find out later, but the reputation of the Israelites has preceded them. Um, they know, the, the people in Jericho know what, um, what the Israelites had done, that, and it was blowing their minds, and they were scared. And we're going to find out later when Rahab talks to them just how scared they were. Um, and we also get another little detail. So this, this is nighttime. This, uh, this story is taking place at night. So, set the scene. Um, so, and she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, and you will overtake them. So she, she tricks them. She deceives them. Um, and the, the, the men go chasing, chasing after. All right, so... The next, uh, the next little section, this is going to get interesting, I think. I think it's interesting. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, <laughs> but she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. Um, that's, again, AI. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, what does that even look like? So that was kind of interesting. I don't think it would have looked like that. It would have probably been flat on the ground. But um, the... Uh, the stalks of uh, flax would have been laid out on the roof to dry, to dry out. Um, there was probably a lot of it if she could hide them. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, that's what flax looks like when it's growing. It, it grows in wetlands. It needs a lot of water to grow. Um, oh, wait, uh, who knows what flax is used to make, by the way? Yeah, flaxseed oil. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like baskets? Not baskets. Yeah. What? Linen. Linen, yes. Linen. Linen. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the oldest textiles that they figured out how to make. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of, I'm going to walk you through how flax goes to linen because I think it's interesting because it will show you a little something about Rahab and just how much work her life involved. <laughs> Um, so go to the next slide. So redding, that's a weird word, but um, basically after they harvest the flax, they soak it in water. So you can see the, the dudes in the, um, the farmer dudes are putting the, in the pits there. That they're going to soak it, and that's what it probably would have looked like back then. Um, they put boards and then stones on top so it weighs it down and stays underwater. It stays that way for like a week or two, underwater. So that's... Um, going to help break down the fibers. So the, go to the next process, and then, and then you dry it out. And um, in this case, that's, I think that's Europe or something, so they're not doing it the way they would have done it back then, but they would have laid it out on the rooftop because the rooftops were flat, and um, they got a lot of sun, so it would dry out. Um, and then go to the next slide. Yeah, beating, then you'd beat it. Like that, that kid, I think, may have also gotten that end of the stick the way he or she is looking at it. Um, but you would just uh, whack it until it, it got loose enough so you could spin it into uh, something you can use to weave the linen. Now go to the next slide. This is uh, from a, a tomb of uh, Khnumhotep. I said that, I pronounced that perfectly. Um, this is from about 1900 BC, a long time before this story takes place. But this is what a loom looked like. Notice how many people are using that loom. Two. So this is why I think the idea of Rahab as an outcast isn't really like, I think she was part of the community and she would be doing this. This was just one step in the process of... Uh, her life. So she would not only be keeping this in and doing her prostitute thing, she'd be, a, lot, a large part of her day would be making linen. And it would, it was just a very, very uh, busy life. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so she's, she's, she's industrious. She's, she's smart. We know she's quick thinking. 
um, the way she uh, gets rid of the spies, uh, not the spies, the, the men pursuing the spies. Jumping back into the text, so the men pursued them on the, on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and she uses the covenant name Yahweh. Uh, I know Yahweh has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. Um, so it's, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention, it's not really the Red Sea, it's the Sea of Reeds. They just, it just gets translated that way. It's, I don't know why. Um, dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came up out of Egypt. And that's something that happened 40 years earlier. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Um, I think that's so interesting. She, and this tells us something very specific about her faith. She didn't know a lot. She probably couldn't tell you a single line of Israel's law that Moses had given them. All she knew was that that God was the God of heaven and of earth. And, and when, you, when you think about what the Canaanite religion was like, that's, that's almost insane. There, there's a different God in heaven and a different God on earth, in, in different gods and in, um, multiple gods in the heavens. And, and, and there's not... Um, this, is, this is a real faith. She's seen what God has done. She heard about the Red Sea. She heard about these great, great defeats of uh, the other enemies of Israel. Um, she knows God is in charge. And that's something I think important about, um, important about faith, is it doesn't take, it doesn't take a, a great knowledge. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to even know anything in the Bible. If you, I mean, think about new Christians, especially, man. I, I love it when I hear from a new Christian because they just love God with all their hearts, and they don't know anything almost. They just know enough, and that's all it takes. Um, it, it's, I, I called this, um, I subtitled this like the faith of an outsider, I think. So and the reason for that is like you don't have to be, it's not so... It's not like a long process to become a Christian. It's instant. Once you have faith in God, that's it. Once you know this is, this is the true God, I'm going to follow this God, uh, that's it. Um, and then, then it's a long, long journey to grow in your faith, but uh, it's just as simple as that. Uh, jumping back in. Now then, please swear to me, this is Rahab talking again, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours. Then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Um, so, they, made, they gave her an oath, and the reason she could rely on that is because oaths were taken a lot more seriously probably than they are today. Um, I'm going to give you one example, and it's kind of a gruesome example, but it's a good one. Um, so it, who, know, who knows about Jephthah's vow? Jephthah's vow and Judges. All right, Londa, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a story you'll hear in Sunday school, and it's not a story probably you hear in church a lot. I'm going to tell it. Um, it's in the Bible, and it's not, because it's in the Bible, does not mean it's a stamp of approval, okay? Um, but let me just read you. It's about 11 verses um, in Judges chapter 11, um, 29 to 39. I'm going to read it because I think it's good to know just how seriously people took vows in this culture. 
Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So you can probably imagine where this might be going. So um, I'm just going to skip down. Anyways, uh, yeah, the sons of Ammon uh, lose. Jephthah is victorious. Um, And then skipping down to 34, when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came about when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Um, anyways, uh, without, without reading the rest of that, he does uh, what he said he would do. And the book of Judges um, is kind of a sidebar, but the book of Judges is not... Uh, a list of good ways to live your life, just so you know. Um, it's, it's a really tragic book, actually, and it's, it's told not in order, so it's really interesting. You get to the end. The last story is like one of the first events that takes place, but it takes place last, and, and it's, it's awful. It's really, uh, that's another one you probably won't hear preached about, um, or you definitely won't hear in Sunday school. Um, but uh, anyways, oaths were taken very seriously, especially an oath to the Lord. Um, so she could rely on that. Um, that was enough for her. Um, now let's, let's think about the, the position she's in now. She's helped the spies. If that gets found out, her and her whole family are dead. I mean, that's, they're, they're not going to, their lives will not be spared. She is risking her life, she's risking her family's life, but she believes in God, the God of Israel. She's relying on the God of Israel to come through for her. All right, so let's continue on. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days, until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. Um, so she ge- gives them wise advice. Um, I want to explain real fast the, the house built into the wall. Uh, cities at the time, one of the mark- markers of a city was that it was walled. It was a place you could protect each other from. And like we mentioned earlier, in order to take that city, there would have to be a siege. and, and and we think uh, Jericho is probably built around a spring of water, so you had water, and if you had enough food, you could last there a long time um, without uh, having to leave the city. Um, so, so they had this wall already, so they would build houses right into the wall, and it probably wasn't the best place to live because, you know, that's, <laughs> you're going to get the rocks thrown at you first and stuff. <laughs> like, you're, you're right um, on the edge there. But uh, it's the least protected um, place. But she, her house was built right into the wall, so it was like, um, and it was like her wall, basically. Um, and this was a pretty common uh, layout uh, at that time. Uh, all right, so going to the next slide. This is interesting. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then, if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be in his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is... With you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. All right, now, what does this remind you of? The scarlet cord right there, above the window, or out the window. 
<laughs> a movie theater. What's that? What'd you say? Passover. Yeah. Remember. Fill with the comments, man. <laughs> it does kind of remind you of a theater, movie theater. Um, yeah, Passover. This was something that the Israelites, by the way, are going to celebrate. Uh, they're going to observe Passover right before they go into the land. So this will be fresh in everyone's mind. Uh, Passover, they painted the blood of the sacrifice, the sacrifice lamb on top of the post and lintel of the, uh, uh, of the entrance of their, their house. So this is kind of the opposite of that. It's, they're going in through the walls, but they're going to pass over Rahab's uh, house. And as we'll see when we get to the walls coming down, it's not really Israel passing over, it's God um, passing over Rahab. So, um, continuing, continuing through our story, if, but if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. The spies asked for more than... Del- oh, it's not. It's my notes. Sorry. That's not the Bible. Um, so the spies asked for more than uh, just deliverance. They, they want total alignment with uh, the purposes of Israel. So don't, don't just, like, save yourself. Don't tell anyone about this. Don't, like, you know, play both sides. Um, you know, have, like, a little insurance card. Um, don't tell anyone about this. Um, because, again, she's really dooming her family if God is not real. Uh, going back into the text, they departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. Uh, Oh, then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the lands melt away because of us. So they uh, follow Rahab's instructions and report to Joshua, and that's the, it's good news that they bring, that, hey, people are scared of us. Um... They, they were uh, terrified. Now, now we can go one slide more, I think. Yeah, okay, so I tried to make the text bigger, but it's still small, sorry. So Shittim, which is there, is where they are, the camp of Israel. This, the blue squiggly line is a, uh, not a curvy road. Thank you for the mouse assistance. Um, that's that's a, a river called the River Jordan. <laughs> And then Jericho's way over there. All right, so we'll just stay on this slide because we're going to also see Gilgal, which is two miles away from Jericho right there. Thank you. This is so helpful. I love it. Um, you're, we're going to see how they get from Shittim to Gilgal. Now, one thing they do, they, they go up to the, the River Jordan, and how are they going to cross it? There's no bridges. they got no time for bridges. <laughs> so... They bring the Ark of the Covenant, and the waters part. They cross Jordan on dry land, just like they did um, when they crossed the Red Sea. Now, they're reenacting parts of their own past from a generation earlier, or a couple generations earlier. Um, They're crossing through on dry land, which means that God is leading the way. Um, They cross through on dry land. They get to this place called Gilgal, which is, uh, they name it Gilgal. They set up memorial stones there. Um, they also do something else. <laughs> they, the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness, had not been faithful to follow God's commands. So the men were not circumcised. So they circumcise all the men, wait for it to heal before they go into Jericho. But um, they circumcise all the men <laughs> as adults. Yikes. Um, I, I watched my sons. Ugh. Don't recommend. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the, uh, then this interesting, interesting detail comes out. So they've, they've done all this. And then um, a strange, mysterious figure appears. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
the commander. So if you guys know who this is, this is an interesting figure. So a man comes with his sword drawn. Um, it says, I'll just read from the text. This is in uh, Joshua chapter 5. Uh, let's see. I didn't put the verse in here, but it's verse something, something. Um, oh, another, another interesting detail. When they ate from the promised land, once they had crossed the Jordan, as soon as they ate, no more manna. Manna had been coming down from heaven to provide for them. It stopped as soon as they ate from the, the promised land. Now this commander, let's find out about this guy. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes. So at this point, um, he, they're, in Jer- they're near enough Jericho, so the siege has begun. Um, this is not the marching around yet, but the siege had begun. Everyone's locked up in, in Jericho. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the Lord of the I, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So what does that remind you of? Taking off the sandals. Burning bush. Who was in the burning bush? Well, he wasn't in the burning bush. Moses was at the burning bush. Who was in the burning bush? Yeah, the angel of the Lord. Yeah, which is also, yeah, that's a little more advanced theology. Yahweh. That was Yahweh's manifestation. Um, he appeared as a man. Um, and when he talks, uh, some scholars think, and I, th- I think it's very reasonable, I think Joshua recognizes his voice. Why? Because Joshua was Moses' assistant and stood outside the tent when Moses would talk to God face to face like a man. The commander. So that very well may have been Yahweh that he saw, the angel of the Lord. Um, It's likely the case. All right. So, uh, going, jumping into the text, I think this is, yeah, chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to start talking about the walls of Jericho. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. So, again, siege warfare starting. Um, it's going to get, uh, yeah, so this is basically, uh, for all intents and purposes, the battle has begun uh, in the form of the siege. So, and the Lord said to Joshua, and this is probably, I think it's this, the commander um, speaking uh, to Joshua, But it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Uh, You can advance the slide. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. That's that's what Jericho looks like now, kind of a dump. Um, But... Probably pretty cool back in the day. Um, those are mud brick walls, so um, kind of normal for the time. But yeah, there is a site. It's called um, uh, Tel Es Sultan. Um, and uh, did, did you ever go there when you were in Israel? You did? Does it look like that? Is that the right side? You remember? Yeah? Cool. Um, anyways, it's there. You can go visit it, um, I think. Um, on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. Um, You can uh, advance one slide so we can see what the, that's kind of what the city looked like, maybe. That's an artist rendering. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns 
before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the Ark, while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded uh, commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout, then you shall shout. Um, so he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city going about it once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Um, you can advance one side. I want to show this. Um, so that's like a, an aerial picture. You can kind of see uh, it's not that big. It's about a mile around, I think. Um, so you can imagine walking around that a mile one day, and you're done. Um, one interesting detail is no one's talking, silent, except for the ram's horn. And um, I don't have audio for you on that, but it sounds really cool um, when you hear it. Uh, uh, ram, uh, I was, yeah, OK, this is a sidebar, total sidebar. but. Um, in <clears throat> there's a there's a um, little uh, there's it's called the letter of Aristeus. It's it's uh, uh, it kind of describes how the Septuagint was made, but it also describes going to Israel and and they see this uh, Gentile sees the sacrifices that all the priests are doing. This is in the second temple period. So after the first temple was destroyed, they built the second one, um, but this is before. King Herod and all that. So, um, they they describe the sacrifices as totally silent. Like the priests aren't talking, no one's talking. They're just doing it all silently. So it kind of brings this really uh, almost eerie feeling into the air when you see all these soldiers marching around, but quiet, totally silent, except for these ram's horns. And, um, and the reason, I think, for that was because this is not going to be Israel's victory. It's going to be God's victory. Um, you can advance a slide. Um, uh, then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was uh, walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did for six days. Um, now, now we're going to get into the seventh day, and this to me is like really bad strategy from a human perspective. Let's march around basically seven miles before we do a full-on attack. I don't know. Maybe I would have done it differently. This is why I say it's God's victory. <laughs> like, wear out everyone <laughs> completely <laughs> in the hot sun, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Um, this is why it's God's victory. It's not man's victory. So on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times, which they were probably glad about. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that was with, uh, is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Um, so anyways, the, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit for time, but they, uh, they, they obey, and on the seventh time, they blow the horns and shout, and the walls fall, and they attack, and they take the city. Um, but Joshua's, uh, this is in verse 22 of chapter 6, but to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her, as he swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute in her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
Um, so, uh, man, okay. I'm going to whiz through this last part, but it's a really interesting part. So that's the whole story. Um, you can go to the next one. Next slide. So what happened to Ahab, Rahab, Ahab, Rahab? There's, there's a hidden sequel, um, and I'm going to kind of blaze through this a little bit because of time. But um, So as I said earlier, the Old Testament's silent on Rahab. We don't hear about her again until Matthew. So this is why I say there's a, there's a hidden, um, hidden sequel. So in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 1, we see uh, that she ended up marrying someone uh, named Salmon. It's, uh, let me read you the exact... Um, and to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab, and to Boaz, Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed, Jesse, and it goes to David. Um, so she, she was uh, married to Salmon, and we don't know anything about Salmon, but we do know quite a bit about Salmon's father, Nashon. You guys all know Nashon. I don't have to tell you this story. No one knows Nashon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he, he was the prince of uh, Judah. In fact, he was the first person, first person to uh, uh, offer, make an offering on the altar of God at the tabernacle. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. He was the first chief to consecrate the altar in front of the tabernacle. Um, this is in Numbers chapter 7. He was called a prince of Judah in First Chronicles. So she basically ends up marrying a prince. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. She ends up marrying a prince. Um, so this, and this kind of unlocks more details about her. So um, she... Uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit this for time. There's, this is like the best stuff, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, she, so if she was, um, yeah, I'm, i got to cut out a lot of this for time. Sorry. No, we can't cut the song. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just, you can ask me more. There's a lot more details. It's really fun. Um, but so she married Salmon and uh, basically a prince of Judah. Her son is Boaz, who marries Ruth. There's a whole book of the Bible about that. Um, and she ends up having this uh, really, really great, um, really great life uh, that she would not have expected. And there was no guarantee of that at the time when she had faith. Now, let's put this back into Hebrews, because I think that's always uh, important with this. Remember what's going on with Hebrews. They're facing a crisis. Um, the church is already under persecution. Um, and the, if you're Jews, and this was written to Hebrews, um, who knew their Bible, it was looking bad. They were going to be uh, wiped out by Rome. It was just the writing was on the wall. They knew what was going to happen. Or it had already happened, and it just, this book didn't mention the temple destruction. One of those two things. So, uh, why is he bringing up Rahab? Um, I think it's, the, it's this emphasis on uh, her action. Uh, for one, she's a complete Gentile. No connection to Israel whatsoever uh, um, at all. She's a complete Gentile. Um, and she is, uh, it says, by faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. She did the right thing, even though it would cost her her life if it just didn't work out. Um, and when we, you're either an outsider or you're an insider, right? You're one of those. If you feel welcome in this community, great. Um, if you don't feel welcome in this community, um, you don't need to get to a certain level of Bible knowledge or of 
uh, years spent in the community or years spent serving, it's about faith. And just one act of faith is all it takes. And for us, really, just faith in Christ. That's it. Um, But for those of us who maybe aren't in that outsider status, we need to look at outside of our own cliques and just see who are the people just making that one step of faith, showing up and just wanting to learn more. Um, There's a place, this is supposed to be um, a family, and I think in so many ways uh, it is, but I wonder often, like, who am I not looking at? Who am I not welcoming in, either by just being blind to it or by, um, you know, just not really wanting to be social? Um, I don't know. I, it's, something, it's something that we want to, or we must, uh, look out for, because it's the outsiders who come into the faith, who are often the biggest heroes uh, of the faith. Um, So with that, with that, I'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for um, just leading the way in in, um, going before us and making sure that we have, uh, we have a Savior, Lord. We have um, the big things in our life we don't have to worry about, Lord, because we, if we follow you, God, we, we don't have to worry about that stuff, Lord, no matter how it turns out, if it turns out good or bad. Um, thank you for being there, and thank you for um, watching over us. In Jesus' name, amen.